How are y'all doing today? Trick question. How's God doing today? Is he still on the throne? Is he still faithful? Has he done something in your life? Is he going to do something more? Then go ahead and tell your neighbor, I'm in the right place. Let's give him glory and praise today. Amen. All right, so today uh, we're going to continue in this uh, series called Rethinking Worship. We began last week, we talked about some of the essentials, right? We were looking at Psalm 95 and we took this concept and this idea of what truly is worship. Worship is not just a tingly feeling that I get. It's not a choice that I just come into and I get to critique the service and see what's happening and, and I, I come in as the final critic, and declare that was good today or that was not good today. Uh, service, uh, worship is not just about me, but it's about God. And so we defined it last week as the proper response that comes from the depths of our soul, the depths of our hearts, our innermost being that places God, whereby it places God above everything and everyone else in our lives. That it worship, is worship. We talked about how worship is, is possible because of the fact it is necessary. It is what we do because of who God is and who we are in him. Amen? And I, I'm sorry to admit, but I didn't get too far, and so we just got excited, and we spent some time in actually praising God, but I feel like the Lord was with us last week, and as you saw the worship this morning and what God is saying to the church, I'm just excited that I, I feel like the Lord is really birthing this in us because we need to press in in this season to know God and to declare the wonders of his name and press in, and when we do so, it unlocks so many things for us. It does so many different things for us. And so today, I want to continue in our series, and we talked a little bit about what it is and why we do it. And, and so today, I really want to press in a little bit more, just defining it a little bit further by contemplating on some of the marks of a true worshiper. The marks of a true worshiper. And uh, there's so many ways that we could do this. And honestly, I've spent all this time looking and researching and reading this book and that book and, you know, and it's so many different thoughts that are on my mind, but I came back to this one story that I just so love. So I want you to grab your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 7. And I was almost tempted to go to John chapter 12, but I stopped in Luke chapter 7, and there's some correlations, but we'll go there. We're going to find one of the great stories of worship in the Gospels right here in Luke chapter 7. It takes place, of all places, at a party. You know, we see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. He goes to a wedding. He's at a party. Jesus likes to go to feasts and, and have dinners at people's homes. And, and he, we find him here in this great story of worship at a party. He's at a dinner table. And we see him doing that because that's where Jesus ends up finding people who need to encounter him. He finds people who were not only enjoying themselves, but ready to be touched by God. He found people that needed to extol his name and encounter him. Those who needed to cry out to him. Those were the places where Jesus found them. And so that's where he was. And that's exactly what happened in this story here in Luke's gospel. So if you're there, say amen. We're going to read a few verses together. Amen. I got one person. Anybody else with me? Amen. Okay, here we go. When one of the Pharisees, we're in verse 36, sorry. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, and that she is a sinner. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, this story 
is a well-known story. And many here, Lord God, have probably heard this several times. Lord, I know I've preached this story before, but I love this story, God, and I pray that it would just come and minister to us today. May your word, Lord God, richly dwell within us. And Lord God, bubble up, Lord Jesus, out of our innermost being, practical application that we would live and be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's take a look at this story here. You may be familiar. Have you heard this before? Anybody who's heard this story before, just raise your hand. All right. So you guys are experts. You know exactly what's happening here. But for those of you who have not heard this, here's the deal. There's this Pharisee. That was a group of, of, of people who were the religious elite of the time. These people were learned scholars. They were the ones who knew the rules and regulations of Judaism. And they were the ones who kept over the Torah and they read the scriptures. There was a religious Pharisee by the name of Simon who was hosting a dinner party at his house. And he requested that Jesus would join him. Come into my house. And, and, and I don't know if you remember this or you've heard about this, but the Pharisees and Jesus didn't quite get along too often. Not so much that Jesus did not care for them, but so much so that they just did not really care for him. Oftentimes, these guys wanted to catch him in a lie or, 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 or what they were considering a, a discrepancy in his belief or his system or, or what he was proclaiming. Uh, things that they perceived to be lies, but it was not so. Oftentimes, they wanted to just trick them and get their own way and, and get people to keep their attention and their focus upon themselves. Yet these guys, this man, Simon, invited Jesus to come to his home. And when a woman in that city found out that Jesus was going to be there in this local town right here next door to where she is, you know, commonly used to being around, she says, I've got to go to this place. She learned Jesus was coming, so she turned up and she came on through. We're not told her name here in this Luke chapter 7, but what we do know is if we look at other stories, John chapter 12, uh, there is a correlation, there's a lot of similar details, it could be the same story, it could be a different story, but if we look at that story in John chapter 12, then we could probably say that this woman's name was Mary. What we do know about Mary in Luke chapter 7 is that she, uh, about this lady, is that she was a a lady that did not receive the best of commendations in her town. She did not have the best titles. She had a couple of labels that were associated with her that was not the most reputable. And uh, bottom line, if you look, some of the scholars have argued and debated that she was in fact a prostitute. She was a woman of ill repute. And so in this place where Jesus is about to go have dinner, this place, the, the house of a Pharisee, a learned scholar, a scribe, a person that is keeping of the law and is righteous before God, or that is the expectation, in his house, this prostitute is coming in. And in those days... Typically, people would be uh, inviting rabbis to come to their house, teachers, masters. They would invite them to come and speak and teach and say some things at the dinner party while they reclined at the table. And, and they would host this party, they host this dinner in the courtyard of the house. And so it wouldn't be that everybody who would attend would be reclining at the table having dinner, but they would allow people to come on the periphery and hang out in the edges of those courtyards to be able to listen to that conversation. And so that lady says, I've got to be there. And she shows up at that inner courtyard and she's there to just listen. She's probably one of the listeners that was there who had the courage to go into this Pharisee's home. A place where she knew she probably would not be welcome. She shows up to this place and she's there to listen. So track with me what's about to unfold in this situation. Catching sight of her, I bet you that there was probably people who started having conversations. They started sending, you know, these hushed whispers and these, you know, little remarks. Oh, do you see who's here? Check it out. Look at, oh, she's here? What is she doing here? And, and these comments are starting to go in the peripheral of this courtyard because this woman of ill re reputation is here. 
And these scholars do not want to mingle with her. So what's about to unfold here, because in the day they didn't get around you know, in Teslas, and they didn't go around in Hondas and all these things. They actually walked everywhere that they went. Um, People would get dirty as they journeyed and walked from one place to another, as they journeyed from one location to another. And so what's about to happen here is that so many of these guests had dusty feet and dusty sandals. They show up to this party. They're about to recline at this table to have their dinner, The custom was that a servant would come out to the house and and they would go ahead and wash everyone's feet and take care of everybody so that they would be able to recline at that table and have their meal. Are you tracking with me? Those of you who don't, uh, I'm trying to paint you a picture of what's happening in this place. And so wiping the feet of a guest was the job of a servant and there's no mention anywhere here in in chapter 7 in these early verses of a servant coming out to take care of any of the dinner guests. Or any of those who have entered into this courtyard. And so through the course of the party, this lady begins to weep at the feet of Jesus Christ. And she is wetting his feet with her tears. She's crying out as she sees that puddle surrounding his feet and trickling down his toes. She goes and wipes his feet with her hair. Then she anoints him with perfume. In the eyes of the pious Pharisee, the man who invited them there, Simon, this woman was making a scene. She's making a mockery out of this time. She's actually, you know, disturbing the dinner. She is taking the attention away from the main event. This woman, through her uncontrollable tears that are falling upon Jesus, the guest of honor that is there, this woman is disturbing the dinner. How many of y'all feel very welcomed in this moment? If that was you in that party, how many of you are starting to feel very uncomfortable in this party because you know what, Uh, things are not going the way it's supposed to be going. Ever been in a situation where you start getting embarrassed for somebody else? Anybody ever had one of those moments? Man, I used to have a friend in elementary school. He is just bold. He's just bold for everything. And he would do, you know, he would do things that I would never imagine that I would do. And sometimes just when he started talking, I'd be like, just be quiet, just be quiet. I'd start getting embarrassed for him. But you know what? I I learned to admire his boldness for the things that he would do. And and he went and experienced some things that I never dreamed of doing at that age and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, that is not the point here. So through the course of this party, we see that this woman causes a scene. She's weeping at the feet of Jesus, but she grabs this perfume. And it tells us there that she starts to wipe and pour the perfume all over the feet of Jesus. Mark chapter 14, verse 5, gives us a little bit more information about that perfume. So does John chapter 12. They actually tell us that it was a costly perfume, that it was appraised at about 300 denarii. A denarii was pretty much a day's worth of wages. And so if you're having... 365 days a year, 300 denarii is pretty much a whole year's worth of income. You know, if you subtract the weekends that you don't work, uh, 52 weeks a year times two, yeah, pro- probably about a year, a year's worth of, of income. And so the Pharisees are just scandalized at the fact that this is happening at the middle of dinner. This woman who should not be here is over here causing a ruckus, disturbing the peace, taking away the attention. She is doing something that's embarrassing. She is doing something that she should not be doing. And you know what? Not only that, but there's some other things that are going on in their minds. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So the Pharisee goes ahead and challenges Jesus. If he were a true prophet, he would know what kind of woman would be touching him. There's a lot of of customs and manners of the Bible and ancient Near East in that time, in that culture that's happening here. Number one, a man would not be hanging out with a woman. Uh, A lady would not in a public setting be touching a man in this way. It would not be proper. There's other things that we'll talk in just a little bit that she is doing that is not considered to be right for her to be doing so. So the response of Simon the Pharisee, the man who invited Jesus, was to judge the woman. 
And he saw himself as a morally superior person to her. And he thought that Jesus was unaware of the state of this lady's morals and what was going on within her heart and her life. But Jesus knew exactly who she was and what she had done. And in response, Jesus told a parable. So take a look with me at verse 40 to verse 42. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Which of them will love him more? Jesus knew exactly what was happening inside of Simon the Pharisee. He knew what he was thinking and what he was doing. And so he answered Simon's thoughts. It does not say that Simon was speaking these things out. Jesus perceived what was in his heart. And Jesus, like a master, goes ahead and starts speaking to that issue in his mind. He read his mind and saw the judgment and the hypocrisy that was there. Which one loved him more? If 500 denarii would be 500 days wages and 50 denarii would be 50, so about two months or so, which one is more? A year plus or two months? A year plus. And so Jesus talks to him and says, you know what? Which one, Simon? And Simon answers the right answer. I bring you to the story because I find it to be a very, very incredible example of worship in the New Testament. See, there is so much that is said about worship in the Old Testament, and there's so much that we can learn about the different words and the different expressions of worship that are found all throughout the Old Testament, and they kind of come on through into the New Testament. And Jesus then takes and summarizes, and he starts talking about the things that we shared last week, that to worship is our proper response to God that comes out of our heart and places God above everything and everyone else. To love him, you must love him in spirit and in truth. To worship God. You worship him in spirit and in truth. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And you know, the second commandment, you love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus condensed all of worship, condensed all of those commandments down to these incredible truths and maxims. And here we find the mark of a true worshiper. The first thing that I want to draw to your attention is this. If I look at the experience of this lady, uh, the mark of a true worshiper is a realization of sin and an embrace of grace. A realization of sin and the embrace of grace. The sinful woman had responded to Jesus in the way that she did because she realized the depth of her sin. Now, it does not say what Jesus was declaring at that table. It doesn't tell us what he was teaching as he's talking, you know, in the midst. He's been called to be the keynote speaker of that dinner, the main attraction, the guest of honor. The one that was coming to share and everybody else could come and hear. It does not say what he was saying, but yet something, something about his presence, something about what he was declaring in that moment and saying in that place and him being right there in front of this woman made her come face to face in grip with the realization of her sin and the embrace of grace. I wonder what was said. It's like that story when the woman caught in adultery, another woman was there, and all the people had picked up stones to stone her, and all of a sudden Jesus gets down on the ground, and he starts writing in the sand. I wonder what Jesus started writing in that sand. I wonder what he's saying here in this place. But regardless of what it was, this woman was willing to make a spectacle of herself in order to let Jesus know that she knew she needed his grace, that she needed his grace, and she was grateful for the change that he simply made possible at that moment. What a scene. We don't know what was being said. There are so many people there, and yet here's this woman who comes and she starts responding in worship. 
Her response is worship to God. The true worshiper in this story is not the Pharisee Simon who invited Jesus, the one who kept the law and knew the law and the regulations, the one who was supposed to be the authority, the one who should have recognized Jesus and received Jesus and been excited about Jesus being at his house. It was not him who was the true worshiper, but it was this sinful woman, and she's responding to the grace of God. A primary motivation for worship is gratitude for God's grace and mercy. Can you say amen? Only when we're marked by the realization of your sin, of our sin, and the greater realization of the mercy that God responds to that sin will we offer costly worship. This lady offered something that was valuable to God. She offers something that was costly to Jesus. Uh, the worship team's been reading a book that I found my, on my wife's desk, and I just picked it up because it looked pretty cool, and I started reading it. Uh, it's called The Reset by Jeremy Riddle, and he says something interesting, an observation regarding the cost of her worship in this book. In The Reset, he says, this wasn't just a costly jar of perfume over a year's wages that she was pouring out on him. It was costly... Because not only was it the price, but this lady is breaking at the feet of Jesus. She is making an act that cost her everything in terms of dignity. It is, if we are wishing to retain any ounce of dignity, any ounce of self-respect within our social context, that is not something that we're going to be doing right there. This lady starts pouring out of herself of her self-dignity. She starts pouring out any self-respect in this social context. Has the realization of your sin, okay, let's bring it home. Has the realization of your sin, has it cost you anything lately? Has the realization of our sin and the realization of God's grace spurred us to an ex? Exaggerated, extravagant, stupendous, fantastic response. Has it cost us something? Have you been spurred to toss off self-respect? To toss a little bit of dignity that you might have left? Has it cost you those things and say, I'll toss it up in the wind? True worship has to cost us. See, Jesus Christ says, you need to pick up your cross and follow me. You want to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. You want to be a worshiper marked by true worship. You are a person who's going to offer to God not something that is expensive, but something that is costly. And there is a difference. Anyone can give away something expensive. Only people who understand sacrifice and recognize the depth of God's grace and mercy are the ones who can actually go ahead and sacrifice to do something that is of true worth and give away something that is costly. Here's this lady who's pouring out all of her self-dignity and her respect in this moment. Maybe some of us When we choose to become true worshipers of God, it's going to cost us our reputation. Maybe some of us, when we choose to become true worshipers of God, it's going to actually cost us some social capital with our colleagues or our classmates. Maybe if we become true worshipers of God because we have encountered the depth of our sin and the mercy and grace that God meets us in the midst of our issue. Why? Because worship is a response to what God has done for us. Remember last week, because he loved us first. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Maybe because we come into that realization, we're going to actually give away something that costs us in these moments. You know what? Maybe for some of us, what is costing us is a little bit of time. For others, it might be costing us some resources and finances. For her, it definitely did. It cost her over a year's worth of wages. But not only that, it cost her a greater, greater thing, her dignity and self-respect. She's in a place that nobody is going to welcome her, a place that nobody there would really want her. A place where she is feeling criticized and all eyes looking to her. 
It may cost you time. It may cost you money. It may cost you your reputation. It may cost you a little bit of your dignity. It may cost you something that is sizable. You know what David says? I will not give unto the Lord that which costs me nothing. Worship that is given unto God has to cost us something. Sometimes we want to come into God's presence and we want to feel God's power and we want to come into his anointing and we want God to move and, and, and have his way in our life, in our family, and yet we're not willing to pay the cost and pay the price that is necessary for us to experience that level of victory. We want God to move in our school. We want God to move in our family. We want God to move in our church, but yet we come here on a Tuesday night and the prayer intercession altar is so full i'm being sarcastic we want god to move on this young generation and we say you know what here pastor here's my teenager you take him and you take care of him you got him for two hours on a friday night fix him But has it cost us the extra work of fasting and praying at home, of buttressing with the word of God, of coming alongside and modeling for them the faith and the walk of what being a true worshiper of God is? Are we ready to pay the price and are we giving God what costs us? There's so many examples that we can get into, but I think that you understand the mark of a true worshiper, the person who encounters God, has recognized that, you know what, I am in need because my sin is great, and yet there is such incredible grace that he meets my sin with. We recognize that reality, therefore we are able to give him something that is costly. We don't even ask a question. We don't even doubt it. We just go ahead and give it. Why? Because we've encountered him in that way. The second mark of a true worshiper is forgiveness-based intimacy. Forgiveness-based intimacy. Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly. Jesus said, which one has loved more? Which one has more intimate? Which one has encountered? Which one is the true worshiper? The one who has been forgiven the bigger debt. The woman had responded to Jesus through an act of worship, but Simon had not done any of the things that should have been done for the guest of honor. See, Simon did not do anything out of the normal custom that he needed to do. He did not meet Jesus and greet Jesus with a kiss. He did not anoint, not anoint the head of Jesus or the feet of Jesus. He did not give Jesus the proper respect, the proper intimacy that was needed as he is the host inviting him in to the home. Contrast that with the way this woman is worshiping and what she's doing in the midst of this experience. Jesus was way more than a guest for her. For this woman, she wasn't just giving a polite nod to him or doing her duty, but she was intimately serving someone who had changed everything for her. This woman... She was doing something beyond her role. It wasn't her duty. It wasn't her job. It wasn't her responsibility. It was not what she was compelled to do out of obligation. This is something that this woman has stepped into to do without the proper resources, without the proper supplies. She had no basin. She had no water. She had no towel. This woman just gets up and starts doing with whatever is available to her. Why? Because she had encountered intimacy with God through the forgiveness of her sins. She starts to cry over his feet, pour out tears. She starts to kiss him at his feet. You know what? That would never happen in my house. My wife hates feet. She hates feet. But I don't want that to happen either. It's okay. But just think about that. She's kissing the feet of Jesus. She is pouring over his feet. You know what? They're walking everywhere. It's dirty feet. It's probably got a lot of dust and maybe some bugs. I don't know. I don't know. But she is doing all of this, and she pours out this expensive perfume. She does all of this stuff while the Pharisee did not show great gratitude because he was ignorant of his great need for forgiveness. 
See, there was a story of a, of a little boy and who had his dog, and his dog loved that little boy. He loved his master. Who He would jump up and lick and be with him all the time, and this little boy would go to school. The dog would follow him to the bus stop, and he would sit there, and he would wait for the little boy to come back from the bus, and when the little boy showed back up from school, he would just jump on that kid and, and just, just run circles around him. They would go home together, and they would be so, so together. Excited. This little dog loved this boy, boy, an unquenchable love for his young master. And why was that? Because that boy had found that dog when he was a mangy stray mutt, and he had taken him home, and he nursed him, and he cleaned him up, and he took care of him. He bound up his wounds, and he fixed that little dog up, and he gave that dog so much love and so much attention, so much care, that that dog did not ever forget his little master. See, this lady, like that little dog in the story, she understood the forgiveness that God had given to her. I don't know what Jesus was saying to her in that day, but you know what? She encountered Jesus and saw the depth of her sin. She realized the grace that God was offering, and, he, and she realized, you know what? I can be forgiven. Therefore, she came into an intimate relationship with Jesus. Did you know that for a woman to let down her hair in that time was something that you would only do in the confines of your home? It was something you would only do in the presence of your spouse. And here Jesus is not her spouse, yet in a public dinner in a courtyard, surrounded by people with eyes watching, this woman of ill repute, she lets down her hair, she bawls her eyes out, she pours out this expensive perfume. She does something that is of intimacy because she had experienced the forgiveness of God. Whereas Simon's lack of worship was anchored in his self-sufficiency. Here's a man who thought he had everything he needed, who knew everything he needed to know, who had everything figured out, and he was self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency is a great sin in the Bible. Did you know that? We are to be dependent upon God, to worship him in spirit and in truth with all our hearts, minds, and souls to have no other gods before him. And when we are self-sufficient, we place ourselves above God. We declare ourselves to be independent of him, that we do not need him, that we were not made to be in relationship with him. But you know what? That is a sin that we need to get rid of. And so it's sad that in the same room where God is there, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the, the, the triune God, Jesus, is there in this place. His presence is richly in that spot. Like I know me and you, we don't go to a dinner and Jesus is there physically. He might be there in spirit, and his Holy Spirit now is what we experience. But you know what? He was there physically, and yet in this room where everybody was there and he was present, so many missed him. Because they never experience forgiveness. They never experience the intimacy that is found once we accept the forgiveness that Christ has for us. You know what? There's something there. If you go to uh, Psalms 139, it talks about this. The psalmist asks, where will I go and flee from your presence? Where can I go? Where can I go and flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, I see and settle on the far side of the sea. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Where will we go and flee from God's presence? See, in this room where Jesus is present, here is a man who did not see Jesus, encounter Jesus, because he never experienced the forgiveness. His self-sufficiency wouldn't let him. He never had intimacy with God. See, there's, there's this term in the Bible. We see, the, we see that concept in Psalms 139, the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere. The earth is his footstool and the heaven is thrones, that God inhabits you know, the world, the universe. God is everywhere present. He is always everywhere. God is omnipresent. However, When we encounter Jesus through the forgiveness, when we realize that we need him to forgive our sins, that he is the one that is making a way for us, that his grace is there to meet us in the depths of our sin, and he wants intimacy with us, we go from experiencing the omnipresence of God where God can be everywhere to experiencing the manifest presence of God. 
that God is right here manifest specially in this place in this time. That woman ex- experienced the manifest presence of Jesus in there, knowing him the way that he was meant to be experienced. I wonder how many of us were crying out, we're like, yeah, God is with me because he's promised. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you till the end of the age. But then Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be also. So is there a contradiction? No, there is the omnipresence of God that he is everywhere at all times. But then when we come together, when we realize that I'm putting my faith, the belief in God, that he is the one who can save me and forgive me, and I come into that faith-like relationship, and I experience the forgiveness of my sins, and I am focused on him in faith, I am gathered with my brethren, there comes the manifest presence of God that we get to experience. And these people missed it by a long shot. The third mark of a true worshiper is the gratitude over judgment. Gratitude over judgment. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he saw, said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. All too often, we're like Simon the Pharisee. Let's be real and talk about worship. We're like Simon the Pharisee. We show up to church we show up to some place, we, we experience something happening in our world and around us, and you know what? We don't own our sins the way that we should own them. We don't look at ourselves the way that we should truly look at ourselves. We come into this place and we see the, the plank in everybody else's eye. Oh no, we see the speck in everybody else's eye, but we forget the plank in our own. We come into these places where we, we, we are dispensing judgment as opposed to gratitude. Judgment as opposed to experiencing God. We judge others because we don't think that we have sinned as bad as they have. We have not sinned as bad as they have. Well, you know what? Sin is sin, and it doesn't matter whose bones they're on. Sin is an abomination to God, and we cannot be reconciled and okay with it. We don't recognize how God has given us grace to avoid sin. We don't realize what God wants us to live like. So we're not worshiping in truth and worshiping him truly. And so because of his self-righteousness, Simon could not really worship. He could not really declare the wonders of God. He could not really appreciate the intensity and the, the critical aspect of what was happening in that moment. He couldn't really worship. He was more interested in the Bible study and theology than he was in the presence of God. He was more interested in what he could learn about God and what was there than actually being with God. He was more concerned about all of his accolades and his title and his prestige and all of these other things that he missed Jesus entirely. How many of you have gathered facts about God? That's awesome. I pray that you not only gather facts, but that you also gather his presence that you gather an experience, that you gather an encounter with him because you have experienced the gratitude that God is here for you, that he is truly your savior and that he is available for you to throw yourself at his feet. I spent way too long on this, but here's the deal. True worship is throwing yourself at the feet of a savior. It's realizing that, you know what, I'm not better than anybody else, but I am in need just like everybody else, and maybe more so than somebody else, and I need God. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners, and I need his grace and his mercy. In my weakness, he is made strong. It moves us, true worship moves us. It involves some tears of repentance, and it involves gratitude inside of us, as it did for this woman recognizing the depth of our need, recognizing our sin and our issue should move us to a repentance that brings gratitude in our lives. See, here's what I see here happening. And I see it in church, unfortunately. And you know, I've been guilty of doing this myself. So Lord, help me, forgive me, and and lead me. Sometimes we come into God's house with an attitude of judgment as opposed to an attitude of gratitude. We come in and we start seeing something that is not desirable in our eyes or agreeable in our eyes and we start meeting it with judgment. You know, we're in the middle of a sermon and God is, is, is pouring out his message through the prophet, through the pastor, through the missionary, through the person who's preaching the word, through the worship. And all of a sudden that kid is uncontrollable, that children's church hasn't started yet, so the kid is running around and he's crying in the middle of service. And so now... In judgment, I cannot receive the word of God for me because, you know what, that kid has become a distraction to me. 
or I come into a church service and then somebody is sitting in my seat, therefore I will not receive the blessings and miracles of God today because somebody has taken my seat. God will not find me two seats away. We come into a church service and you know what? We experience this issue or that issue or, or that sister or brother did not come and talk to me. Therefore, they must have an issue against me and they don't love me. They don't accept me. And what is this whole thing? The church is supposed to be a loving family. And never mind the fact that they had a terrible week and they're in need of you coming to encourage them. But you know what? That person is not loving. And so I cannot experience the fellowship of God in a church Because I have come with judgment as opposed to with gratitude. Instead, the heart of a true worshiper, the the worshiper that is marked by God, is a person that comes into the church and looks at each and every one of these circumstances and says, glory to God. Praise God that that little kid is running in a church as opposed to running outside in the world. Thank God that that little kid is screaming at the top of his lung because he's got a voice that he's going to praise God one day and he's going to glorify God. Thank God that this person is here sitting in my seat because now I have a new relationship that I'm going to forge and establish, a new friend that's going to encourage my faith. I am grateful to God because he is actually doing something in my midst. I praise God for the opportunity that I can come. I'm grateful that I'm going to be a hand of blessing in the life of this family that never said hi to me today, but I'm going to be able to do it today. See, the the heart of a true worshiper does not allow any deterrent or anything that is uh, not agreeable to them, anything that is a distraction to them or a disruption to them to come and bring judgment into their hearts. And you know what, church, if we do this in here, please believe you me that once we walk out that door, we do this very badly. That person we meet at at the store That's inked all over. That has piercings up the wazoo all over the place. Who is, you know what, just cursing like crazy and doing this or that. It doesn't even have to be that. It could be the person that looks like a perfect saint that's all perfect, but is just doing something you don't agree with. And so you start judging their experience or that as opposed to being the worshiper that says, God, I give you glory for this opportunity that you're placing before me. God, I am grateful for what you're doing. A true worshiper experience gratitude over judgment. See, the core question, the worship can come on back. Um, I want us to spend some time here in just considering the marks of a true worship person. A true worshiper is giving God something that is costly. Something that's going to cost them of their time, their energy, their resources. God is worthy to receive all of it. We know that. He is worthy to be praised above everything else because it's our proper response to him with all our heart. He goes above and beyond everything that we could ever ask or imagine. The core question about worship is how much do you love him? If you see yourself through your own eyes, you may think that you're pretty good and you're a pretty good person. You've got it together. But you need to see yourself as God sees you. You need him. You are needy for him. You're needy of him. Worship is a response to a relationship, and that relationship is important to express how you feel. You have to express how you feel. It isn't just a religious duty. It isn't just coming and amassing facts and gathering knowledge about God. It is experiencing him through the power of him forgiving our sins, through us giving to him something that is costly, that's going to actually put some things on the line for us. It's adoring him because of the grace he's afforded us and the forgiveness that he affects in us. It is coming to him with gratitude over everything he is because we love him. Because we love him. The Bible tells us that in the end of days, the love of many would grow cold. This woman's love wasn't, it wasn't beautiful or seemly even. It was messy. It was ugly. It was wet and snotty. But then she filled it with some sweet aroma. See, when we come to God and we worship him, it tells, them, it tells us in the Bible that our worship becomes a sweet fragrance unto him. And it's pleasing, and it's a pleasing sacrifice unto God. Our prayers, our worship, our songs, our spiritual hymns, the things that we bring to God becomes all things that fill his bowls. And it tells us in Revelation chapter 5 that the prayers of the saint, the, the worship of the saints, it, it, it's the incense that fills the bowls of heaven in God's throne room. It's pleasing unto him. It smells good to him. 
whether your sins are heinous or they're public like this lady's, whether they're, they're, they're under the, the radar or they might be more sophisticated of the white collar variety, it does not matter. Sin is sin. And a sophisticated sinner still needs Jesus. Whether you're the most nasty of sinners or you're a sophisticated one, it does not matter. Let us never forget that we have been found by him. He wants to live in us and wants us to experience his manifest presence. Available to us at every location, at every time, because of the fact that we have encountered him by choosing to accept the forgiveness that he has for us. Some of us will come into worship and it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't look intimate. It's like standoffish. Maybe Jesus has come into the room and we're in the outer courts, but we're missing him because we're so concerned about judging everything that is happening. We're so concerned about everything that it could have been or isn't being. And instead, the master is right here present and available, yearning, already having given his love to meet your sin, yearning to encounter you intimately. He deserves it. There is no amount of extravagance that would be wasted on him. There's no amount of what you could possibly lose that you will truly, truly, when it's all said and done, will you be ashamed that you gave up? I invite you to stand with me today. And I just want you to reflect. I want you to close your eyes and just ask yourself this question. Am I going to care more about what God thinks or what people think? If we can get really honest, we're not embarrassed or afraid or hesitant on God's account. If we're really honest, the thing that holds back our worship is the person sitting next to us or across from us or behind us. It's the person across the counter or across the aisle. The person at our school, the teacher in our classroom. It's the doctor that we're going to have a conversation with. It's the people around us that we become so hesitant, concerned more about what they think as opposed to what God thinks. If we're going to be marked as true worshipers, we have to take a page out of Peter's book and the other disciples when they were forced into this question and Peter replied to them all and said, we must obey God rather than human beings. What are you going to do when someone says, will you tithe? What are you going to do when someone says, will you go to God's house? What will you do when somebody says that, you, you know, when you say, I got to go to Bible study, I got to participate and be there present at prayer meeting. I got to wake up early and spend time pouring over God's word. I got to invade my home with songs that actually edify my spirit and lead me closer into God. What will you say when people start questioning that of you? Can I challenge you to live your life for the audience of one. The audience of one. Worship God first and foremost. A.W. Tozer writes, for the Christian, everything begins and ends with worship. Whatever interferes with, one, with one's personal worship of God needs to be properly dealt with and dismissed. Keep in mind that above all else, worship is an attitude, a state of mind, and a sustained act. It is not a physical attitude, but an inward act of the heart towards God. Today, I want you to close your eyes. There may be somebody here in this place that you've decided you were going to let the judgment of other people be more important than the judgment of Jesus. You've decided that, you know, over the course of time, you've allowed every excuse of why you can't give or why you can't do or why you can't be. It was too much of a price and you chose not to pay it. Today, let me just remind you that Jesus Christ, he left heaven 
and came down to die a sinner's death that he did not deserve so that you could be reconciled back to the Father, so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be made well and made right with God, so that you would be cherished and precious in the sight of all those who would judge you. He would say that he loves you and accepts you. Today, the invitation is this. If you need to just ask God for repentance and say, Lord, I've stopped giving you what costs me. I want your prayer to be this. Jesus, what is one thing this week that I can start today, not tomorrow? The greatest you know, day on the calendar for people starting diets is tomorrow. For some, it works. But you know what? Don't be like that. Today, what can I do, God, that costs me something but signifies that I'm worshiping you? Just ask him to put a finger on it. And will you just pray this prayer? Say, Lord, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it through your grace and your mercy. Father, I pray that you would just encourage every heart that is here today, Lord. That woman gave away something that costs everything she had. And Lord, we get to talk about her sacrifice to this very day. Lord, in this room, there are people who are going to start sacrificing for you to worship you, Lord Jesus, as they encounter the depth of their sin and the the greater depth of your mercy towards them, God, as they encounter, Lord Jesus, the forgiveness and intimacy that you afford them, Lord Jesus. Develop a heart of gratitude. Father, I pray that you will change families and change marriages and change, Lord God, communities because of what they are committing to do to give to you. May you enrich them, bless them, and guide them. In Jesus' name.